All right. Hi, folks. Thanks for tuning in to this month's Hangout with Chad Henderson, Nota Brewing Company's head brewer. My name is Lauren. I'm the communications director here at Nota Brewing Company. This month, we have a very special guest joining us to talk about the inspiration behind craft beer. In other words, we're going to talk about the people, places, and things that have made this industry what we know it as today. But before Chad gets started with today's topic, I would like to introduce our guest. And quite honestly, our guest is someone who really doesn't need an introduction because he is one of the pioneers of the craft beer world. Craft beer world. We are thrilled to have Sam Calagione, the founder and president of Dogfish Head Brewery, here with us today. Finally, I'm also happy to introduce Paula and Tori of The Savage Way. The Savage Way is a Charlotte based marketing consulting company that comes up with creative concepts like clean graffiti and moss art, as well as supporting local businesses. They'll be monitoring social media to find your questions and comments throughout the Hangout. Now, while Tori describes how this will work, go ahead and follow them at The Savage Way, and make sure you're following us at Nota Brewing. Okay. Hey, guys. Um, thanks for having us on again. Um, so there's a few ways that you guys can engage with us on social media. The first one is through Google+. So what I need you to do is if you want to talk to us through Google+, is enable your questions, and that is a top grid on the right-hand side. So if you hover over that, you can just simply enable the questions app and that will be able you guys can type in questions to us and we'll get them answered the other way is to talk to us through Twitter so of course use um, at Noda Brewing and then we also use the hashtag Noda Hangout so you can see that hashtag Noda Hangout and we will do our best to get our questions over to um, Sam and Chad and that's about it Awesome. Thanks so much, Tori. I believe Chad and Sam are ready to hear from you guys, so keep those questions and comments coming. Uh, Chad, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks a whole lot, Laura. And thank you, everybody, for joining us for this Google Hangout. I'm very honored to have Sam uh, be a part of everything. How are you doing today, Sam? Awesome, Chad. Good to see you again, and you. thank you for inviting me to do this. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Uh, uh, just to start everything off, I get on a soapbox a box a lot about talking about craft beer and why it's so important and why it's, so, it's such a big movement now. And a lot of it has to do with the whole creativity aspect uh, and being able to express yourself through through the art form of craft beer. But I think one thing that's also really special about craft beer is that you can really feel the personality and the and the individuals that make it through the product itself. And when I was getting into craft beer. Uh, Sam, you and your company were like one of the first ones that really jumped out to me, not only because of the stuff that you were making, but also the way you represented uh, the company itself. And I think that's really important because as craft beer brewers, we really put our soul and our, and our spirit into the beer. And when you can actually have a person to identify that with, it really helps send that home as like, God, oh, this guy really thought of this or this girl really thought of it, you know, applying this to, to make this thing uh, something very special. So. When I was getting into craft beer, you were one of the focal points, along with other icons like like Greg Cook from Stone, uh, uh, Lauren Salazar from New Belgium, and Garrett Oliver, and when I, you know, a lot of people that really put themselves out there to really express the beer and be a part of the message of, of the beer itself. So when we made Noda, we wanted to make sure that people knew who we were when we were making the beer as well. So uh, I was wondering if you could just uh, give us a quick, for those who don't know, which I doubt anyone tuning in does know the, at least a little bit about Dog the Shed, just kind of where it started, how long you've been around, and, and where where you come and you know how far you span the whole uh, you know the craft beer world right now? Sure thing, Chad. Well, on behalf of my 230 coworkers, thank you uh, for your kind words about uh, Dogfish. Uh, we opened 20 years ago, about 20 years, two months ago. Uh, when we, at that era, 95, Dogfish was the smallest brewery in America. Back then, there were about 600 breweries in America. Uh, with one new commercial brewery opening every week in America. And today there's about 4,000 breweries almost in America, two new commercial breweries opening every day, um, which is wonderful and shows how vibrant and, and accelerating our industry is. For, for us, in 95, when we were the smallest brewery in the country, and today in 2015, when I think we're about the 14th, largest craft brewery in the country. Our mission hasn't changed one bit in that in that time. We've we you know for us our, our rallying cry is off centered ales for off centered people and it's really you know we were sort of the first brewery to look at the entire culinary landscape 
for potential ingredients instead of focusing on military or militant uh, beer style guidelines. In the early days, we took a lot of shit for that and were considered weirdos and heretics for putting chicory or coffee or maple syrup in our beer. But it's been wonderful to see the entire craft beer blo world blossom and get so adventurous uh, in every state over the last 20 years. Absolutely. Yeah, I actually remember one of the first beers that really kind of sent home Dogfish Head as being like one of the breweries I wanted to absolutely know everything about was uh, the first release of Theo Broma. And, uh, and the reason why I was like, it was like, this looks like some sort of Belgian blonde ale or, or golden ale, but it tastes like a whole buffet of different sorts of flavor characteristics. And I asked the person who, who, who gave me a sample of it, I was like, what, st what style of beer is this? And he was like, I don't know. <laughs> it's like it's a spice ale, I think, and it, and it was just the it kind of blew my mind because I was trying to get my head around like all the different standardized styles and Dogfish Head, which many people would argue it was the the complete engine behind the whole idea of looking at beer styles from another angle and not having to abide by an actual rule book, and that really en entranced me on uh, the story of Dogfish and whatnot, and uh, that's that brings me to the point of uh, you know my generation of brewers and any any brewery that's open with brewers in the past. Uh, eight years, nine years or so, has been kind of spoiled because we have kind of icons of the industry like yourself and, and those that came before around the same time as, as you did. When you were starting in 95, did you have any sort of uh, iconic people that you kind of looked to as being like, you know, maybe I can get some advice from them or look and, look and see what they've done and kind of learn from it and who, who those people were, if there were any? Yeah, no, that's a, a great uh, question. And certainly, well, you know, our brewery tries not to... Uh, you know, follow or copy what any other brewery does and uh, trends and, and, and stuff as well. But there's certainly breweries that inspire us, uh, and particularly for me. I drank crap beer when I was in college, cheapest I could find, like pretty much everyone I know. But after college, when I started working at a beer, a beer bar, waiting tables, in one week I tried Chimay Red and... Sierra Nevada celebration, and those became sort of my epiphany beers. And uh, getting to know Ken Grossman and the, his son Brian are good friends of mine. We were the first brewery to do a collaboration with Sierra Life and Limb, and there'll be others that we do together in the future. Uh, but that's a brewery that I think is critical to all of our opportunities. Open so many doors, and you know, and then Fritz Maytag at Anchor, while while he didn't start that brewery, he bought a failing regional brewery. He certainly revived some robust, flavorful styles with Liberty Ale and and uh, their porter. And it, and I think of Fritz Maytag and Ken Grossman when when Ken you know needed equipment to grow and Fritz outgrew some equipment. That was the first moment of sort of mutually supportive, altruistic, collaborative activity that our our craft beer communities built upon when Fritz would give Ken a, a pump that he outgrew or a valve that he couldn't outgrew or sell it for scrap value. You know, our, our industry was built upon that camaraderie and it started with those those pioneers. Absolutely. It's a rare industry. I've said this on, on multiple hangouts. It's like you very rarely find any other industry where you can so easily go to a quote-unquote competitor in the same industry and get advice, get equipment, you know, get ingredients. Actually, a local brewery here uh, just yesterday ran out of gypsum and were in the middle of a mashing and realized they, they had a delay in their ship and they didn't have it and they swung by and I had an extra bag for them and it was no big deal, you know. So it's a, it's a wonderful uh, industry because of that camaraderie. Uh, but one thing we're also spoiled with too is, I mean, we have, uh, I don't know, it grows every hour it seems like, but we have like, you know, over a dozen breweries just here in our own, you know, county right now. And we were, we were the second oldest uh, still operation, but still in our state alone, we could just drive anywhere between an hour to two hours and go visit a well-established brewery and get tips and look at stuff. You know, when when you started out, you actually had to change laws to even operate as a brewery uh, in Delaware. Is that correct? Yeah, we were the first brewery in in the first state. You know, Delaware was the first to ratify the Constitution, and uh, so we're proud of that distinction. But what it meant is when we opened, there was not a community of craft beer here. Uh, but I'm very thankful to the cities in Philly and D.C. and Baltimore, which are just two hours from where I'm sitting right now in coastal Delaware, and they welcomed Dogfish Head in as a local brewery, even though those cities were two hours away. So 
you know, my, my great friends are, are at those breweries like Victory and Stout, and we kind of grew up together in the mid-90s uh, period, so we did have some great breweries around us, just not in our state, but we've been able to, uh, you know, write the legislation to, to, you know, I wrote the brew pub statute and the microbrewery statute and the craft distiller statute, and and so our our state's very friendly to entrepreneurs that allows us to do that ourselves. A lot of big states, you'd have to have lobbyists and lawyers and a lot of people running interference for you. So God bless Delaware. <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad you're able to get it done. Yeah. Um, we got actually a couple of questions uh, from uh, Tori. Tori, you want to read over to us? Oh, I don't speak dog. <laughs> I'm blue. Sorry about that. Okay. That, Doug? Yeah. So, um, Stephen Taylor on Google Plus says, first of all, you guys rock. And he says, as a home slash craft brewer, uh, experimenting with spices and fruits, is there a specific spice or fruit or combination you absolutely would never try again? Sam, I'll let you take that one first. <laughs> well, first of all, Stephen, thanks for saying we rock and. I think I speak for Chad and I when I say we're both huge Aerosmith fans, so right <laughs> back at you. Uh, but uh, things that didn't work, I, we did a beer with uh, lavender buds and peppercorns in the, in the late 90s, and uh, we added way too much lavender, and the first comment card we got back said, this beer tastes like tongue-kissing Laura Ashley. <laughs> So we, we learned to tamp down the lavender uh, as early as the late 90s. How about you, Chad? Uh, I haven't had anything so far that it was like that was an awful, you know, attempt or whatever. But there's definitely some spices like lavender uh, and also like star anise or anise, however you want to call it, uh, that go way further than you think will go in the batch. So like you can do – we actually did a collaboration with uh, New Belgium this past weekend. And um, it was actually us and the other local Noda neighborhood breweries uh, and uh, the guys over at New Belgium on their pilot system. And they put a handful of lavender, uh, local grown lavender, into a, into a eight hectoliter uh, or sorry, ten hectoliter batch, eight and a half barrel batch. Yeah. And the very first thing that screamed out of that batch, even in mid fermentation, was tons of lavender. So when we did the second batch, we did we just didn't even throw it in there. So yeah. I think that it's more so you just really got to be careful. Might be it might be worth like making teas of stuff if you're gonna use it, especially any of the like herb based spices that are like pretty pungent as they are. Make a tea out of it just to see how much a little bit goes into like into like one you know standardized volume of, of hot water just to see how pungent it's gonna be because some stuff can get completely overwhelmed like like, like with the lavender and and, and star in it. Um, but so far either things I, I think we've been more so uh, having issues with something being not as pungent as we thought it would be, but those usually are just trying to be really careful on like fruit additions on some small batches, like uh, raspberries you, tends to be pretty tart, and if you want to put, I've done a couple of raspberry stouts, and uh, it tends to be a really small little gray area before it goes for like, oh, I kind of almost taste raspberry to like, oh my god, this is a framboise ball that's just dark. So, yeah, no, no horrible mistakes so far, but definitely uh, some lessons learned. Uh, is there another question, uh, Tori? Yes, there is. So this is um, from Charlotte Beer, Daniel. He says, to Sam, a lot of what you did in the old days was pretty out there, but today a lot of people don't bat an eye at some of your offerings like they once might. Is that a good thing, or do you feel the need to keep pushing the limits? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, uh, uh, you know, sometimes uh, we... Uh, I'll give you an example. We just came out with a beer called Chalk Lobster. We've been brewing it for three years, but we've never distributed it. And, you know, oyster stouts is a tradition that's existed for over a century in, in England and using oyster shell and yeast loves some of the minerals that's in the oyster shells or, or even using the whole oyster. But we had nobody had done a commercially available lobster beer until we made it three years ago. And it was def definitely polarizing. And we had some people say, oh, you're just being weird to be weird for weird sake. But we actually, the way the cocoa nibs and the chocolate and the lobster work together in the beer, we thought it was great, uh, a great liquid. And uh, we were very proud when it won a, a silver medal at, at the GABF. But even though we, we love it as a liquid and the story's very uh, unique, it's still polarizing, even now that we're distributing it. 
Um, so it's kind of like that's why there's thousands of beers out there. Everybody's palate's different, and uh, people can choose to say, oh, that's too weird for me. Uh, I just think that they should leave it at that and say it's too weird for me and instead of saying that beer is too weird to have ever been made because then you're trying to speak for everybody based on your palate. So I just love seeing breweries go in a zillion directions and experiment, and I hope that there's more beer geeks than there are beer snobs that try and tell us all what we should be drinking. Don't be a snob. Always be a connoisseur or advocate. Yes. Yeah. The big difference is tell, is arguing why you should drink craft beer, not why you're wrong for drinking whatever you were drinking. So Amen. That's, that's the big line that people need to follow. But uh, when when you were starting out though, Sam, what was what was like the weirdest beer that uh, that was currently available at the time, or where uh, you know when 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 you actually got you know opened up and everything like that? Was there like something that was just totally left field? Or was everything pretty pretty by the book at the time that you were? Uh, I want to give yeah. I think I'd give shouts to uh, to uh, Sam Adams Triple Bock. It comes in a tiny blue bottle. I don't even know yeah. if they still make it. I've had one actually before. I like a '93 and a '94. Yeah. What would you, like, you think? Uh, at the time that I had them, which was in the 2000s, <laughs> they were uh, they were pretty oxidized, but they were pretty insane. They had like a well, they, they had pretty heavy soy sauce note. Yeah. So point, well, probably just from the oxidation of but they, like. The body on them was insanely thick, really, uh, really rich. I had them yeah. probably six years ago or so. Yeah, and, uh, they were. I mean, they were. I can imagine having them in a younger state would just blow my mind at the same time too. Just what? What was the ABV on those? I think like, around fourteen back yeah. then. Fourteen. They're close to standing costs uh, in, in strength. Yeah, but yeah, they're yeah. Very, very pungent. And so it's, that was probably the the most insane thing I had right rate, rate when we opened, and it's actually the beer that got us to say. Because you know Delaware's coastal Delaware's pretty dead in the winter, and so our second win, third winter open or something, we're like, man, no one's coming in. What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? How about we try and brew the strongest beer ever brewed? He said, all right. <laughs> so you know, Triple Bach inspired us to do the Worldwide Stout, which was had the record as the strongest beer for about a month, and then they yeah. came out with uh, Millennial, yeah. and then we 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 did. Raison Dextra, and then they did Utopias, and we put up the white flag and said, all right, you guys can keep doing that. We're just going to hang out here with 120 minutes. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, it was funny. The, uh, the certain beers, and it's not it's not always just dogfish. I know I sound like a fanboy and stuff like that, but honestly, like the, the, a lot of your beers you've done are important to me. The first time I went to the GABF, me and my roommate who went with me, our celebratory night before a uh, uh, bottle that we opened was, uh, a, I believe, a, a four-year-old worldwide stout. So just like nice. you know, so that was that was that the first beer you guys did that still is in the lineup to some degree as of now that uh yeah, back that's a great question um, no I'd say Indian Brown which is Indian yeah. Brown Ale uh, which was the first black or dark IPA in America I think and it's the it's a trademark we have to defend the most because most folks yeah. think India Brown Ale is a style but it wasn't really a style till we did it we now just tell we now just tell any brewery that comes out with Indian Brown Ale Hey, just sign this thing that you acknowledge we we did this and got it registered as a name, and send us a case of your India Brown Ale because we're tired of having legal battles <laughs> with little brother, little our, our brethren, small uh, breweries. But that was uh, certainly the the first. And speaking of GABF, yeah, I mean it was really going to that as a brewer in my mid mid to late twenties and feeling like wow, this is the show. You know, this is our industry was critical for my sort of evolution in the industry and winning our first GABF medals or stuff like that. I imagine similarly for you when you guys won the gold medal in a very hot category at the world, uh, at the world's. What, tell me about that moment for you guys when you guys are at the World Beer Cup and must have been wonderful. Yeah, it was it was definitely uh, worth the torture beforehand because uh, you know, World Beer Cup, for those that don't know, happens every other year at the conclusion of the Craft Beers Conference, and it rotates around to different cities. Uh, so this past year, CBC Craft Brewers Conference was in Portland, but the but the World Beer Cup didn't happen because it happened the year before that when it was in Denver. And that was the year that we won with the Hop, Drop, and Roll for uh, American IPA. And uh, it, was, it was really great, but during the entire conference, I had the neurovirus. So <laughs> I kept yeah. trying to struggle to get to the conference, and and step on the side of the road to try to expel what was ever in my stomach and whatnot. So I, I made it to I think one solid seminar uh, before I could actually like you know walk back to the cabin, go shiver with a fever in the uh, 
in the uh, hotel room. So I was I was pretty miserable. On my birthday, my thirtieth birthday was the day before the World Beer Cup, and uh, and me and uh, and Todd, our, our co-owner, and, and Bart. Uh, one of our brewers, we uh, they took me out to fall, Falling Rock, and for about two and a half hours, I leaned against the wall, like nursing a uh, a lost Abbey beer for just as hard as I could. And after a while, I was like, I can't, I can't be here anymore. So the next day, I felt okay enough to walk and talk to people at least. Um, and was our sole representative going to World Beer Cup and sat in the very back row, in the middle of the row. And you know how the categories are numbered. High IPA is pretty up there. It's like I think number ninety three or something like that. Ninety seven categories. And so we hadn't won anything so far, and the only thing that we had left after uh, the IPA category was the black IPA category, and I think it was like number 95 or whatever. And they announced, I was like just praying for a bronze, because it was completely unexpected that a North Carolina brewery would win a gold that is dominated, in a category that's dominated by Colorado and California and Oregon and Washington and stuff like that. And uh, when they announced bronze was Citrus Mistress, I was like, oh, all right, well, come on, Midnight Madness for Black IPA. I didn't even hear what second place was. And when they said uh, first place and the Noda popped up on the Titan Tron, I basically just, like, just started screaming and hopped out. And I had to, like, Heisman, like, 15 people out of the way. The guys from uh, Coronado were in the row in front of me, and they all, like, turned over and gave me the wave slap and all that sort of stuff. So I all fell in, like, on six or seven people. Finally got up there, and um, it was funny because uh, – Oh God, I forget who um, I forget who was letting me on the stage, but he was he was just like, no, you, you can't you can't go up yet. I was like, he's like, who are you? What did you, what did you win? I was like, I'm with Noda Brewing Company. We just won Gold for IPA, and he was like, hell yeah! And like I was like, get off there! You know, it's like it was, everyone kind of understood like the gravity of it all. Yeah. So, um, and then we had to deal with the 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 hop shortage that we all of a sudden we were gonna have to have, and uh, when we uh, we realized we had to you know triple our production of the beer. Right. So. Those are good problems. Yeah, definitely. And speaking speaking of GABF, uh, you know that I can that when I went, I went for the first time, it was three years before Noda opened. And actually, the first year that I went to GABF was the first year I did the Denver Rare Beer Tasting, which is the first time I got to meet you. And I think that it speaks volumes. You know, now that I am a brewer and I know so many other brewers, to to really try to emphasize the impact of guys like yourself and and people like I said before with like Lawrence Salazar, Garrett Oliver, Greg Cook, these people that are icons in the industry, being as personable and, and as welcoming to the the fans and whatnot, and in when they meet them, like the the time that I stood in line and got to talk to you for a couple minutes, and then I did a work I worked at an event with you like nine or ten months after the fact, and you still remember me from that event, meant the world to me. It's like you can't. You can't put, you know, a value on like the idea of like having someone that you idolize in industry that you hope to kind of luck out and get into actually caring about what you have to say. So going to something like the GABF and doing things like the Denver Rare Beer Tasting, like was in my case, and actually getting to see these people that have done the thing that you hope to do, uh, is a is a huge uh, inspiration. So I imagine going in the early days of GABF and when you have a relatively limited exposure already to the people in the industry and seeing them all communally in the same spot had been a huge instigation uh, for you guys. Um, we got another Twitter question for you, Sam. Uh, tw uh, Tori, you want to ask that? Yeah, so this one is for Sam as well, and it says, um, will there be any more episodes of the TV show? We really enjoyed it, except the chewed up corn episode. <laughs> yeah. It was good beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, all, we say spit happens. Uh, <laughs> So we made we made a beer chicha where we, my, me and my coworkers chewed the corn. There's natural enzymes in in our saliva that can convert starches to sugar. And one of the episodes of that Discovery series focused on that brew that we were doing. But we had a lot of fun. That's we get that request every week of will we do a show again? We are right now shooting a web series. I'll say that we learned a lesson doing that show about how a certain major network interacted with a certain major brewery and when we reacted to that online our show met its fate uh, and now we've been more careful where we shoot our own videos ourselves for our YouTube channel and Justin at Dogfish does a great job of working with me and directing those but then the same guy who was the lead producer on our discovery show he and I and a, and a, and a pretty major online network have been shooting a series of uh, Web, web, a web-based series that'll start uh, airing in in mid-October. So the the short answer is yes, we're doing a new version of a, of a show, but much more for the millennial uh, uh, attention span, eight to ten minute uh, online episodes, uh, and they'll start airing in, in mid-October. So please look out for them. 
awesome. It's good to see that you guys are continuing that venture. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, another thing as far as inspiring stuff, uh, your company and um, Avery, uh, when you did the, the Sam's Quick Sips, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. those videos and stuff like that, I used to yeah. watch all of those, and I used to watch all the ones from the uh, on the website for Avery that was all the different employees in uh, different parts of the brewery talking about different beers and things like that. Those those two instances are what caused us to do the uh, the notable video series that we do. Because we do a new beer every single Tuesday on our small little pilot batch. It's just a single keg of something weird. And we do a video now that associates with all of them. And the first ones were very Sam's Quick Sips, sort of like just standing behind some grain like, this is a blah, blah, blah. And it's got, yeah, and then it evolved into like Batman parodies and uh, Die Hard parodies and stuff like that. So you're part of the inspiration behind us uh, doing that as well, which is we've got hun- several hundred of really silly videos on YouTube at this point. That's um, awesome. Have you, gone, have you gone literally every single week since you started doing the program? Every single week. We're, uh, we're almost four years old, so it's been every single Tuesday. And also a couple more extra ones, too. Like when we have our anniversary, we'll do a special uh, non-Tuesday video release about that. If we have some special announcements. And we're building our, uh, our new facility out now. And we've been releasing about every week to every other week an update video on a different process or how we're building the bar or how we're moving the tanks in. We're, we're upgrading from a 15-barrel uh, three-vessel system to a 60-barrel uh, four-vessel system. And we'll be keeping both open at the nice. same time. So our, our 15 barrel will be kind of like the barrel house and sours and things like that and the 60 will be major production. So we keep, we keep the video updating and whatnot, you know, so it's a, it's like I said, it's a new age of uh, people watching and, you know, a, a five to, to eight minute long or two to five minute video can really send a lot of information over really quick and it's accessible for a lot of people. Uh, yeah. do, do you think on that note that the, uh, the work that you had to do when you were starting out in the beer industry like, without having like the ad, like the invention of social media like it is now has spoiled all of us to just being able to really easily just get on and just throw ideas and, and concepts out there without really having to do a whole lot of effort behind it. Considering uh, what <laughs> yeah, I mean, I you know I, I got to give props to my wife Mariah who runs our social media and was really way you know ahead of that game in, in, in our industry and now there's a few people at Dogfish that just help with that sort of viral or just online marketing. I remember when she's like, hey, Sam, you, you know, 90 Minutes the highest rated beer on this website, and the two brothers that run it really want to talk to you about it. I'm like, beer website? I don't know. This is never going to take off. And then, you know, 90 Minutes in that era is the best rated beer on, you know, beer advocate, like, I don't know, 14 years ago or 15 years ago or something. And uh, and then I've been all friends with the Alstroms ever since. But uh, Actually, certainly... I'm- with uh, Don Alstrom in Colorado when we were over there for New Belgium for a while. Oh, you did? I forgot that he moved down there and he messaged me on Facebook. He's like, hey, you want to get a beer? I was like, yeah. Let's <laughs> just go hang out. You know the places. They're great, They're great, great people, the Alstrom brothers. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, Mariah certainly has done a lot for Dogfish and just the, our fan base helps amplify that online dialogue as much as we do. So we're very thankful that people are as engaged with our brand online as they are, and that's one of our biggest marketing resources. We don't do a lot of print advertising uh, or billboards or, or certainly in TV. We basically do events and social media and our tasting room, our pubs, because it's all about human scale marketing, like a dialogue with your fan base and your friends instead of a monologue like the big breweries do, trying to tell everybody why they're so awesome. Absolutely. It's kind of like the, the social media has allowed a lot more people to be part of the street team, so to speak. You know? Yeah. Yep. Word of mouth, and now that you have social media, everyone can kind of be part of that. Yep. Uh, we got some more questions from Twitter. Uh, Tori, you want to shoot them over? Okay. This is from, um, actually, the questions app, and is Abraham from Mexico. He says, cheers. Um, cheers. Have you ever yeah. had a beer from another brewer that inspired you to create something, either similar or completely different, and why? Chad, why don't you do this one first? All of them. No, <laughs> no uh, uh, some direct uh, references. Uh, the first IPA I made was actually, it wasn't a clone, but it was uh, a 90-minute boil, continuously hopped, very similar to, to 90-minute. And uh, the first, um, it wasn't a pumpkin beer. Actually, you know, I'll, I'll put it this way. Too. Uh, uh, our, the pumpkin and the spices that you use in pumpkin uh, were very inspirational for our current uh, pumpkin beer called Gorgeous. Along with the uh, the pumpkin beer from the imperial pumpkin from Weyerbacher that Chris yeah. Wilson uh, pushes, uh, pushes out, and uh, probably the most direct inspiration one was um, Founders Red Rye. 
uh, was really uh, inspirational for me to make a, a double uh, rye IPA called Notarized. Originally named Soul Slayer, but that's just too evil sounding because <laughs> you know people will get afraid of it. But yeah, Notarized was directly um, inspired by uh, by Founders Red Rye. I haven't tried to clone a lot of beers before, but you know the, conceptually, like, I really liked how the malts and the idea of this went together. I'm going to do this on a slightly different platform, but uh, there's a lot there's a lot more examples than that. But those are the first first three that come to mind. Do you guys? If I know you do cans and not bottles, but it'd be I like the name notarized. How cool would it be if you paid a, an official notary to stand there and stamp every label of the beer, so it's literally notarized? It would, it would be really cool and probably really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the uh, the label for it we don't we don't can that beer yet, but uh, the label for it is a notary stamp and it has notarized. It also has, is famed for being the most mispronounced beer that we do because I spell we spell it phonetically. It's nota our, our logo. And then Rye, and then a, a, a capital Z apostrophe D, and and eighty percent of the people just don't get, like they're like I'm a notarized, and it's like yeah. no, <laughs> you don't get. It. Maybe if it was on a can that you got to see like the fact that it was a notary stamp, it's send it home, but uh, that hasn't happened just yet. Right, that's a great one. I guess for us, uh, probably, you know, when we started doing ninety minute in nineteen ninety nine, or you know. We took shit from West Coast brewers who were like, oh, now East Coast brewers are pretending they can make hoppy beers. Like, jokingly, my buddies, you know, like uh, Tommy Arthur and Vinny from Russian River. And uh, so I was like, you guys ever hear of a brewery called Ballantines from New Jersey on the East Coast who was making a beer called Burnt Nail since the 1950s, a really big 9 or 10% alcohol wood aged super hoppy beer. So we did a beer called Burton Baton where we built these giant 300 barrel wooden tanks and we would uh, do a thread of an English old ale and a really big American IPA and it was our way of saying we want to take the baton mm -hmm. from the original East Coast super hoppy beer of the Burton, Burton Ale and do a Burton Baton so that was one that we had some inspiration from another brewery on. That's 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 been one of my long-term favorites from you guys as well. Actually, I, I've converted many people here in local Charlotte to actually buy four packs of Burton Baton and put two away in the cellar and drink two immediately, and then basically wait like a year or two down the road and then drink the the older Burton Baton right next to a fresh Burton Baton just to yeah. see how they can turn into like two completely different beers. It's really yeah. hard to find IPAs that age well, and the one twenty minutes kind of famous for doing so. I still have one that I'm waiting for ten years. I'm I'm near nine right now. Nice. But uh, it says so on the bottle too. For Be ten careful. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but thanks. Yeah, I mean that. Thank you, Chad. I should be paying you to be going out and doing these things. I appreciate it. Um, but yeah, there. Those are. I, we kind of see nine ABV as a tipping point where certain beers will improve with with age significantly. But improve is also subjective because, as you know, as beers get older, they if they're strong, they don't go bad, but they might pick up sherry and port and oxidized notes. Some people dig that, some people don't, it's up, up to each drinker. It depends on the platform and how it was packaged a lot of that time too. So, What beer that you guys brew is your favorite one that once it's over a year old? Probably uh, Old Voyager is our English barley wine. It stands right at 9.4% alcohol. Um, it, just, it just gets richer and richer. And it, it already starts out pretty well-rounded. Well we have a, a Russian Imperial Stout at almost 12% alcohol aged in Pappy Van Winkle barrels. Actually, I was pouring it next to you at Denver Rare Beer Tasting. This past year? Yeah, this past year. called Monstro. And yeah. uh, it hasn't hit a year yet, but uh, it, well, it basically has because we, we aged it for so long. So that one also... Uh, handles pretty well, and we did bottle that one. So we have a very rudimentary bottling line, which as many times as we bottled on it, we're pretty sure we only want a can from now on because the can line is you know automated. But uh, do but you yeah. Have but, a, do you have a wild goose or a cask canning line? We currently uh, actually do uh, uh, mobile canning. So yep. uh, we yep. have a company that comes and they run a they run a, a, a wild goose uh, canning line for that. Uh, we have at the new place, so we're going to be the first American Leibinger, uh canning line. So it'll be a 30 head. Uh, so kind it's of a rotary, rotary can canning line? Yep. Yeah, it's a German, German company, Leibinger, and uh, 16 ounce can format again. So nice. Look. What do you uh, do, four, four packs with those or what? Yeah, we do, we do four packs on all of them. We do the pack tech on all of them. Uh, right now we do uh, uh, four out of our six year-round beers. Uh, in 16 ounce cans, and we do a lot of our limited release stuff. We do a, a, a double 
uh, maple syrup uh, IPA called Hop Cakes that gets limp. That gets we did it for the first time in, in cans. We had to hand roll all the labels on, which was yeah. so much fun. And, yeah, exactly. uh, you know, like that. We try to do as many limited. We do a, a Hoppy Holidays, uh, you know, seasonal uh, one as well. So we do some limited release things. And this is actually gorgeous. The pumpkin beer will be uh, be out hopefully sometime around September this year in cans. So nice. we try to. It's much better than just hand levering on the on the bottling line. So I you got to start somewhere. Though. You know, you get, we're not that old yet. Yeah. Uh, I think we got another question from uh, from Tori. Yes, we do. Okay, it is one more from Gil Mello. He says, Sam, with a lot of the U.S. craft breweries sending their beers abroad, how do you guys, how are you guys viewing the international market for DHF? D-F-H, sorry. Yes, that's okay. Um, uh, it's a great question because it's ironic that 30, 30 years ago, America beers seen was kind of the laughing stock of the international beer community. They thought we the only thing that we made was this generic light lager in America. And it's ironic that now the countries with the most robust craft beer scenes like Scandinavia, Italy, New Zealand, Australia, they're referencing by and large the American craft brewing movement in their ingredients, the styles that they're focused on, their naming. Uh, so it's really neat to see craft beer from America going off globally. And again, in part because we did that show that aired in something like 40, 45 countries, uh, we've gotten quite a few requests to start exporting. Uh, and we intend to do that someday, but we want to be really methodical and do it the right way and have a person based in the countries that we're selling it in so that we're taking care of our beer uh, and not just shipping it over there. Um, so that day will come. Uh, it won't come in 20, uh, it won't come this year. It might come uh, as early as next year, but uh, within years we hope to do some exporting. We still have 29 states in the good old USA to fill out, so they'll be exporting outside of the states that we're in, but within our country on our uh, horizon as well. Very cool. And so, so you're, you're in 29 states right now, correct? I think we're in 31, so I think we're out of, we're not in 29. Dogfish hasn't opened a new state for, I think, six years. We pulled out of, of four states when we couldn't keep up with demand, but in terms of opening a brand new state, it's been like six years. So uh, we're very thankful to the 31 states that we do distribute in because we've been able to sustain double-digit growth uh, for all these years without expanding our geography. Uh, but perhaps in the future we'll be able to do both. Yeah, you've been a you've been a very big advocate on the whole idea of, of not uh, hitting the gas too fast for all these new breweries coming up, which has been a very wise <laughs> and, and well uh, informed information for the new brewers to to, to take on. Like, uh, do you give any sort of like backstory on on the whole process of like accelerating way too fast and finding out that you, you like overstepping your bounds? Because a lot of people. It's all relative. Everyone thinks that, like, oh, you guys are doing really great. It's like, yeah, but we're doing X, Y, Z amount of barrels a year in this little small pocket or this area. Yeah, it may seem big, or a massive brewery maybe seem like no big deal just because of the regularity of the availability. But a lot of newer brewers don't realize that even what seems like minor gains can actually be overstretching. You know, if if uh, you know if they if they take it too far too soon. So how long did how long did it take for you guys to start you know, doing multi-state uh, yeah. distribution or whatever? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we, you know, even when we were the smallest brewery in the country, it was my ambition to sell some amount of beer someday on both coasts. I never thought we'd get as, as big as we have, and I'm thankful for the drinkers who've allowed us to grow without changing the kinds of beers that we make. Um, but, you know, we grew from, uh, you know, a, a half-barrel brewery to a five-barrel brewery to a 30-barrel brewery to a 50, to a 100, to a 200. And Dogfish still uses a 2.5 gallon brewery, a 15 gallon brewery, a two barrel brewing system, a 100, and a 200. So we're able to experiment more than we could when we were the smallest brewery in the country, uh, but we're now also able to produce hundreds of thousands of beer um, of the larger brands that we make. And we love them all equally, regardless of where they sit on our chart and our biggest 
you know, there's breweries that have chosen to grow as fast as they can because they feel pressure with how many breweries are growing right now to fill out a 50-state footprint while there's still interest in their, their brands. And that's certainly a valid strategy for some breweries. Dogfish, our belief is at our scale, we're still tiny in terms of market share. I think less than half of 1% of domestic market share for sure. Uh, and we're still tiny in that context. But we'll do about uh, 250,000 barrels of beer this year. So for us at this scale, we just feel that between 10 and 15% growth is something that we as coworkers can plan for and digest without it taxing our people, you know, our processes, our lending capacity with money. It just feels right to us. But again, every brewery is different. Right. And feel you know, you have to uh, maintain the culture of what your, you know, what your mission is. You know, if you, yeah. you guys seem to have, from my perspective as a as a craft beer, you know, drinker and advocate or whatever, you seem to have been really well maintained with the size that you've been able to obtain to keep the off-centered ales for off-centered people mentality going through. and It's very refreshing to see that because a lot of times you see breweries get to a certain point where they're like, I liked them back when. It's kind of like if a band gets signed or something like that. You know, they get to a certain point, they lose, you know, who they are. Yeah. Uh, I, got, I got one more uh, question here uh, from Daniel. Uh, uh, Daniel Harsey says, when is the next Pain Relievers album dropping? <laughs> no. uh, so Pain Relievers is my... Beer Geek Hip Hop Band, probably the finest Beer Geek Hip Hop Band of our generation. There's a, there's a lot of them. Oh, right, so. <laughs> right. Also probably the worst. Uh, but no, shouts to my fellow pain reliever, Brian Selders, who's the brewmaster at Post Brewing outside of Boulder. We put out two albums, I think in the late 90s, early 2000s. The first classic was Check Your Gravity, and the second <laughs> was Untether the Blimp. Uh, I believe there's still songs are available at, at uh, YouTube or no at iTunes. Uh, we put out a greatest hits album, which was actually every song that we ever made. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. Called uh, Pain Relievers Awesomeness Equals Yes. So look for that. And then last year we actually got the band back together and we opened for Tone Loke at the CBC and there's a great moment of video where someone was, uh, our friends at Brewbound were doing a documentary about the reuniting of the pain relievers and he got a shot of us coming off stage and all our distributors and fellow brewers in the audience screaming and loving it and they cut to Tone Loke who we hung out with backstage before and they're like, hey Tone Loke, what did you think of the pain relievers after our set and Tone goes, uh, yeah, they're really nice guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's all he said. So we gotta still. I guess I'm saying we gotta still work on our rap game, but we're not giving up our day jobs as as brewers. Well, that's good. That's good on, on multiple levels. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> do, we, do we have any more questions, uh, Tori, or are we set? Okay, shake your head. Okay, cool. Well, uh, do you have anything else you want to add, Sam, or are we gonna sign off? Well, I just want to say thanks for this opportunity, Chad. This is a cool idea that you guys are doing this and. Thanks uh, for, for your kind words about Dogfish, but also thanks for the inspiration. It's great to see, uh, you know, you guys do what you love to do and it working and your, your passion speaks for itself. So congrats on the expansion. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And, uh, and thank you guys for hanging out with us. Uh, just a quick note, if anyone that watches this whenever it gets reposted or currently following and you are working in the beer industry or you, work, or you are working as a brewer, take the time to, if someone comes to, to your tap room and, they, you know, they obviously are doing what you're doing. If they come out of town, take them in the back, show them around. You know, do, do as do as much as you can to show them that you appreciate that uh, that they care about your stuff because that happened to me, and now I get to work in a, in a dream job thanks to people like Sam. So keep up the good work, everyone, and thank you very much, Sam, for joining us. It's been an honor. Cheers, guys. Cheers. 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 Laura, I'll let you sign us off. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Chad, Sam, thank you guys so much. This was wonderful and very informative and hysterical, which is always the best. <laughs> uh, we will be back in September with a new topic and a new guest, and we hope that you will join us. Go ahead, sign up for our newsletter on our website. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Instagram, all that great stuff, and uh, we will announce it very shortly. Hope you all have a great Friday, and enjoy your weekend. Cheers, guys. Cheers. See you guys. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks, Sam.